When it comes to the highest levels of professional motorsport, such as the LMP2 Orica behind me, we don't often get a chance to find out a lot of details about these cars and find out how they're built. However, we've got the opportunity here to talk with Paul from Joda Sport about what makes this car tick. So I think I want to start, Paul, by finding out what exactly is the LMP2 series and what uh, is the sort of basis of that, how much freedom of it has a team got? Okay, so the LMP2 category is basically comprises of a, a four chassis entry, so it's a controlled engine uh, with a, a free gearbox that goes with the, the chassis package. So I think probably from just viewing the, the likes of endurance racing with the LMP2 cars, uh, you might get the impression that teams are building their own cars from the ground up, but that's not the case. This is all about keeping the costs down. So you just mentioned there you're dealing with a controlled chassis and a controlled engine. Yeah, correct. So it's uh, the same engine for everyone in the P2 category. Uh, there's four main manuf chassis manufacturers, um, of which we run the Orica 07. Um, so it's a cost cap car. Um, it's predominantly based at uh, Joe Public, or not Joe Public, but any decent race team going to Orica, and they should be able to buy that car for the cost cap price of around 480,000 euros. Yeah, it's cost cap, but it's still a fairly high yeah, price. But of course, we're talking cool. about <laughs> professional motorsports. So yeah. uh, these are the sort of numbers that we deal with here. So you've got four chassis. So as a team looking to come into LMP2, how do you actually go about making a decision on which of those chassis you're going to choose? Uh, it's very complex. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the engineers to make the right call. Uh, they get a lot of information and data, um, aero figures from all the chassis manufacturers. Um, we cross-reference that with running costs of each chassis, spare parts costs, um, and the overall package of the, the chassis engine com combination. Uh, you won your class at Le Mans uh, last year, 2017, so I'm guessing it's safe to say you've made the right choice? Yeah, I'd go as far to say, yeah, we've done all right. Um, we're very happy with our chassis. Um, we're getting on top of it in terms of engineering and um, the background. We've done a lot of work out ourselves as a team to make sure the car is reliable, safe um, and we can extract the best out of it. So in terms of the chassis you've got four choices there but every team is uh, just running that same 4.2 litre V8 produced by Gibson. How much power is it producing? It's running around 600 horsepower. Um, obviously the, the engine manufacturer never gives away too many secrets. Uh, they'll always give you like a ballpark figure but that's where we believe it to be. Worth mentioning also that is a, a naturally aspirated engine. Now with the these cars running for endurance racing, obviously the life expectancy of the engine is also important. So what sort of service life do you get out of one of these engines before it needs to be sent back to the manufacturer? So it's around a 50 hour um, rebuild time. Um, halfway through that life we do um, oil filters, um, we change the engine oil every time it goes out uh, just to give the engine a little bit of a birthday. Um, obviously check it every time it runs, the guys come from Gibson, download data, go through it, scan it, make sure there's no dramas um, and go again. Yeah, for us uh, sort of turning 50 hours of motorsport racing into a, a distance in terms of kilometres or miles can be a little bit tricky. Have you got sort of a number you can give us, how does that relate? So we generally see over a six hour race including free practice and qualifiers so around uh, 1,650 kilometres, uh, so a race weekend basically is around 1,650 kilometres. That's pretty good uh, sort of mileage for the power level that they're producing. It's also worth mentioning here that again this is a controlled part so you as a team you've got no ability to alter the electronics or do any tuning to the engine, it is just what it is. Yeah correct, it's very stock, as stock as it can be. Um, it's a a, a real race engine, um, but they obviously factor in the the life of the engine, so it has got to do a long distance. Uh, so it's toned down a little bit, probably from complete max of what it can produce outright. Um, all the uh, ECU and the the mapping of it is controlled by Gibson, uh, so we can't play around with that at all throughout the whole weekend. So it's the same same for everyone. Uh, in terms of an endurance race, often power is in everything and fuel economy also plays a factor there. Uh, do you have any ability to make a call to uh, dull down the engine performance in terms of favouring economy, if that's sort of your focus in terms of a strategy? 
Uh, we do fuel save, um, but that's predominantly done by the driver itself uh, rather than like a, an engine map or anything like that. So we tend to ask the driver to lift and coast or fuel save as best you can. He's got a number on the dash that you can see of how much fuel he's using. Um, so he can monitor that himself throughout the that lap and see how he's getting on basically. Now backing that engine is a six speed transaxle, uh, who's the manufacturer of that? It's the uh, Extract gearbox, it's a 1159 uh, Extract gearbox, uh, incredibly good gearbox, really strong, reliable, um, components, Intel components are really well made, uh, they look stunning um, when you actually get them on the bench, they do a real nice product. An interesting aspect here is uh, that X-Track gearbox as well is designed really with quick serviceability in mind. So can you tell us how that works? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a really well thought out gearbox to be honest. Uh, predominantly for endurance racing, it works well for that. Um, the main case itself only holds the bevel set. Um, so everything else is almost in component form. So the diff cap comes off as a completely separate unit and then obviously the diff comes out the back. Uh, right hand casing uh, is the cluster itself, so a rig of nuts and the whole side case comes off with the cluster attached and the left hand side's the reverse side. So essentially if you needed to replace a, a gear set it, it's a quite a simple task, relatively speaking, of removing that gear cluster out of the gearbox and replacing it. It's not a requirement to remove the whole transaxle from the car and strip it down? No, not at all. The gearbox can stay on the back of the car. Um, it is a bit of a fuss for us in terms of we have to take quite a bit of body work off but that's to be expected just to gain access. Um, but yeah, the cluster comes out the right hand side, no problem at all. Now the the differential in there, is there any electronic aids with that or is it purely a mechanical differential? No, it's purely mechanical. It's fairly old school in terms of it's a plate, uh, plate clutch diff. Um, we can change ramp angles, so there's three homologated um, ramp sets we can choose from. Um, you can change number of faces, friction faces within the, the plate stack itself, um, ramp angle, preload, um, but that's about it. And is that based on a driver preference or is it to do with the track or a combination of both of those aspects? Uh, probably a combination of both. If the guys are uh, complaining of understeer we can tune it out with um, a little bit of preload or diff angle itself. Um, it is very track specific as well because some tracks are predominantly understeery or as the case may be, Spa is a little bit different compared to the others so we pre change diff, an uh, diff ramps for Spa. Now with these cars, they do rely heavily on downforce as well, obviously 600 horsepower, they're, they're making a reasonable amount of power given they only weigh around 930 kgs on the minimum, but uh, the aero aspect is quite important. Uh, so with that comes into the case of the ride height that you choose to run, the lower the ride height essentially the more effective the aerodynamics become. But there is a limit on that, can you tell us how that's regulated? Yeah, so there's a front and rear third element on the suspension, so we can control how far the car drops at full speed, and I, with all the aero forces, as you just explained, pushing down on the car, the car will inherently get very close to the track, um, but we can control that with uh, various bump rubbers, um, gaps between the bump rubbers and the stops and the spring element on the front. Now without trying to get too detailed on that third element aspect, essentially it's a, a way of providing a suspension setup that's going to be compliant enough to work at low speed but then that third element comes in when the downforce at high speed becomes an aspect and uh, helps hold the car off the road? Yeah exactly that, yeah, it does hold the, the car at a static ride height and we try to get that as level as possible obviously at high speed um, because the flat the car is the more aero efficient the car is. So we can control the front and rear ride height independently at, at top speeds. Uh, now in terms of maintaining that minimum ride height as well, you've got essentially a wearing plank or it's a Jabroka motorsport plywood essentially on the underside of the car, much like Formula One. So can you tell us uh, how that's utilised and what you need to maintain there? Yeah, so a new plank uh, measures around 25mm new. Um, at the end of any race it has to be a minimum um, thickness of 20 mil, so you're allowing 5 mil grace uh, or wear throughout the race. So essentially the lower the car runs the more chance you've got of wearing away that uh, that plank on the underside of the car against the track so you're sort of walking a tightrope between how low you want to run it and how effective the aero is going to be versus the risk of being disqualified if that plank measures up under 20 millimetres. Yeah exactly that, so obviously the lower the car gets 
the better performance you're going to get out of the car and the faster it will be. But you need to play one against the other and be safe at the same time. So you need to be legal at the end of the race to get the hopefully the, the win and the podium. So it doesn't really matter if you come first if you get no, disqualified. Exactly. No, you need to it needs to be legal in all aspects after the race. So. Uh, now, I just wanted to also talk about the anti-roll bar setup on the front end of the car because this is quite unique because it's non-linear. So can you talk to us a little bit about what that means and, and how that's beneficial? Yeah, sure. There's The drop links on the on the front are made of a, it's almost like a tube with a, a Belleville stack and we tune that in various ways so you can place the Belleville springs in a different configuration which will give you a different um, torque to a, a different curve, a compression curve and give you different characteristics for different setups. We also put different preloads on the Belleville stack obviously to move the curve. Um, once it's overcome the bell wheels, it'll obviously act on the, the standard anti-roll bar. So it sounds like you've got an incredible amount of tunability in the chassis, which is probably completely to be expected. But my question here is, when it comes to trying to make a change because the car is maybe understeering or oversteering or doing something that the driver doesn't like, with so much adjustability, can this actually be problematic in that trying to decide where to make your change first? It can be. Um, the engineers we've got on board are very clever guys. Um, we try, before we go to a track, to iron all these um, little bits and pieces out. So we can put the, the setup on the simulator, try it before we go to the track. If it's not an improvement, we'll try something else. Track time is key at any circuit. So if we can turn up at a track knowing that we've got a good setup on the car before we've even turned the wheel, that's a massive advantage of us over other teams. So essentially you can spend your track time uh, improving everything rather than trying to chase an initial setup problem where you're completely out of the ballpark? Yeah, exactly, yeah. We, we arrive pre-95% there. It is going to be small, small tweaks here and there just for driver comfort or to eke the last little bit of performance out of the chassis. Um, yeah, we try to get as close to the, the setup as possible and say the engineers we've got on board they go through the math before it even goes to the simulator, so even at that point in time we're, we're fairly confident of what we got around us or underneath us. Now this sort of leads into the next question that you're dealing with a control chassis, you're dealing with a control engine, obviously driver skill plays a big factor in this but where are the little uh, advantages that you as Jota Sport have that are going to get you a win over another team running essentially an identical car? Um, as I say, we've got a simulator. Some teams haven't got that on board. Uh, we've got an extremely clever engineering team um, that goes to the nth degree. They'll check, double check, try a million and one things before we've even gone anywhere. Um, the guys train really hard in the workshop on pit stops, fitness. Um, we try to think that we push harder than any other team in the paddock to try and get that, that last little bit out of everything and everyone in the team to try and beat the, the next guy. And actually, while you mentioned that, while we've been filming this interview as well, I can hear your crew outside in the car park doing exactly that, going through some pit stop practice. And from what I understand, uh, your team are basically doing this every day to make sure they're on point. So there's definitely a massive commitment there. Now, the other aspect I'm interested in here with 24-hour endurance races, or just endurance races in general, reliability is key. And again, it doesn't really matter how fast you are if you don't end up getting to the finish line. So what is the process of making sure all of the components that go into the car are up to task and are going to make it to the end of a, a race? So every component on the car has got a life expectancy. Um, most of those come from the, the chassis manufacturer, which in this case is Orica. Um, we sh strictly adhere to those life components and the mileages that they, they provide. Every component has got its individual life number, which is tracked. Um, so every time it goes on a car, it's tracked with a, a big life um, program that we run here in Jota. Um, so every time it goes on a car it's logged and at the end of every event we update that with the mileage it's completed and track it until the end of its life. Once it's come to the end of its life it gets taken out of service into a container, never to be used again and uh, new parts come into service. 
So I mean, not only is this uh, improving your chances of getting to the finish line, but of course we also have to consider driver safety here because these cars are going incredibly quickly. The last thing you want is a, a component failure at speed, which could put someone at risk. Another aspect of this car, which uh, we don't see at the enthusiast level, obviously quite common at professional levels, is the carbon-carbon brakes. And, and again, I'm just interested here with a race that may last, last 24 hours, uh, Changing things like brake pads is, is obviously going to be quite time consuming. Uh, how does the carbon carbon brake package help you there? Uh, so we run an AP racing uh, carbon brake setup on this. As you say, it's carbon pads, carbon discs. Uh, they can run for the whole 24 hours, um, no problem at all. We monitor it throughout pit stops by measuring them um, through the wheel spokes and we keep a close eye on those. Um, but yeah, it should last 24 hours, no problem. Um, as, a, as a comparison to the steel um, brakes that are on the GT cars that are around us. Um, they actually schedule in a, a brake change halfway through the race, so they factor that in. It's part of the pit stop. They have to have a mechanical pit stop, which is classed as a brake change. If we have to do it on a P2 car, that's virtually game over for us because it will cost too much time in a pit stop. It is almost a 24-hour sprint race as opposed to 10 years ago. If you finished the race, it was a big deal. Now it's just considered you are going to finish and it is a sprint race for 24 hours. Um, so if you have to do a brake change, it's a massive fuss. There's a few other advantages with the carbon-carbon brake package. I mean, one of the main ones is that they're obviously a lot lighter than a conventional uh, rotor. Uh, but keeping heat in the, in the brakes can be a bit of a problem with carbon-carbon with brakes compared to, to steel and uh, also their operating point or where they start working tends to be a bit higher. Is there much of an issue, particularly maybe if there is a full course yellow or there's a, a, there's a safety car period for a long, long time? Yeah, carbon brakes are good at generating heat, um, but unfortunately they uh, lose heat very quickly. As you say, especially on if you're behind a four course yellow or under a four course yellow or behind a safety car, you lose tyre temp and brake temp very, very quickly. Um, so we encourage drivers to accelerate and brake hard um, in those circumstances to generate heat and to keep brake temps up, and which inherently produces heat and into the rim of the, the wheel rim and therefore heats the tyre. So it has two benefits it heats brakes and tyres at the same time which when you go green again is a, is a big big advantage because if you've got cold brakes and tyres, you've got no grip and no stopping power. I think that sort of leads into the old debate about uh, trying to get heat into the tyres with weaving versus uh, braking and accelerating. So obviously your take on it is weaving is not the way? Weaving sort of stabilises the temperature in the tyres. It doesn't really generate too much. Um, brake temp definitely increases tyre temp and uh, pressures. So yeah, I'd, I go for accelerating and braking every day. Look, it's been great to get some insight there. Great to actually see under the skin of an LMP2 car and find out a little bit more about what goes into them. Dota Sport are doing an amazing job and we can see the commitment with you and your team. So we wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much for your visit. It's been great having you guys here. Cheers. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.